Well, good morning. I, we're glad everyone is here, and uh, it looks a bit different this morning because I don't see many masks. Uh, how many of you have had this, your uh, virus shots already? Okay, good. Most of us have, uh, and uh, that's not a guarantee, but that at least is additional uh, insurance, as it were. But uh, it's very different to look out and not see masks. Uh, uh, we, we still sometimes feel a little bit naked without the mask on. We've been wearing it for so long. And uh, so we still carry them along with us wherever we go, just, just for insurance. But we're so glad we can get together to study God's Word. And uh, what an appropriate book to study today. First Peter, True Grace for Tough Times. How many of you would vote for this day and this time as tough times? <laughs> yeah. uh, if, if not, talk to me afterward, and I would like to find out where you've been living. Uh, you know. But let's pray together as we begin our study this morning of 1 Peter. Father, we're so thankful for your goodness and grace to us. And uh, even though we feel like we've been through some tough times, we recognize that our difficulties are very, very minor compared to uh, things that are being uh, suffered around the world, Father. Uh, these are perilous times for many. Uh, many are threatened. Uh, their, their life is threatened, Father. Uh, and we, we pray that you would touch the hearts of many people through your word, especially today as the word goes forth all around the world. And we pray that it would go forth with a clear sound and with an invitation to come to a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, as we open the book of 1 Peter today, we thank you for the encouragement and comfort and strength we get from your word. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would take your word and implant it in each of our hearts and enable us to experience the truth and power of it in these days. So Father, we're thankful again for your goodness to us and provision for us. And we ask for your enabling grace for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we uh, often think of Paul as the letter writer. Peter was the letter writer too. It's amazing that in the gospels, Peter, it was really uh, quite prominent among the disciples. Uh, you come to the book of Acts, and uh, Peter is uh, very prominent in the early chapters, but then he sort of uh, disappears into the woodwork a bit, and Paul becomes the, the primary focus. Uh, we come back now to Peter, and uh, Peter wrote two letters. He wrote them much later in life, uh, when uh, Peter, in fact, was facing martyrdom. Probably he's writing from Rome, uh, Peter was martyred in Rome, as Paul was in the 60s, and uh, uh, Peter's writing to us in this first letter about the essentials of the Christian faith and offering encouragement for saints who were suffering. Because in the New Testament, uh, the first uh, decades of gospel proclamation, it spread all over the Mediterranean region, but believers in Christ suffered much persecution as a result of it. And they found comfort and strength uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ for the uh, trials they faced. And Peter is writing about those trials and how to encourage them to, to uh, experience God's grace and goodness in tough times. When you look at the book of 1 Peter, it's a, it's a book that tells us about the true grace for fiery trials. Now, our trials don't seem fiery, but they certainly are tough times. And Peter is going to walk us through how God's grace proves sufficient for the tough times of life. I love the opening statement of Peter because it is so uh, expressive of the whole message of the book. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and he's writing to God's elect, uh, and uh, they're chosen. Now, if you were among the Christians in the, the first century, you probably would say, well, uh, uh, Lord, could, could you choose someone else for a change because I'm getting persecuted. But uh, uh, they, were, they were special to God, uh, but they were also singled out as uh, uh, the, the target of uh, oppression and, and suffering from the Roman government. And so he's writing to God's elect 
who are chosen by God the Father, and notice how he brings the whole Trinity in. They're chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Uh, so uh, their salvation and their life was marked out by God in eternity past. Uh, they're not an afterthought. Uh, they're part of God's eternal plan, and it's through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one who makes it happen or brings it to pass, and it's all through the sprinkled blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Peter is a, a master theologian, although we don't usually recognize him as such. And he's writing to people, and I love the expression he uses, strangers. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you felt like a stranger, but the, the word stranger indicates that, that that's not their home. Uh, this, and we remember the old song of Stuart Hamblin, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. Uh, and we're here for some length of time, but uh, Peter's writing about the fact that we're strangers in the world because our home is in heaven. We have a purpose here on earth. Uh, we're, we're in a sense in a temporary home here, but our eternal home is in heaven. And then he used the expression scattered and he names the five regions in that Mediterranean area that are Roman provinces, as it were. And the term scattered, I don't know if you, when you, when I think of scattered, I think, well, just sort of indiscriminate. But scattered is probably not uh, the best word here because the word is sown. Now, in those days, they didn't have machines to sow fields. But you can rest assured that when they scattered seed, seed was valuable. They needed the crop it produced. And so the soil was prepared well in advance of them scattering the seed. And the seed was broadcast by hand, but it was not a careless process. And so when Peter used that term, uh, one, one uh, a commentator put it out, providentially sown. In other words, they were scattered uh, by, the, by the, the grace and the power of God, but they were sown all through the region to bear fruit. Uh, and it's, it's great to know that you and I have a purpose in God's uh, economy that we, we're placed where we are for a purpose. We're not here by accident. And so Peter's going to develop this whole uh, theme and idea throughout the book of 1 Peter. But he points out right off uh, that uh, heaven is our home. We are just passing through here. Now, it doesn't mean we're casual tourists, but we're, we're uh, temporary residents. And so it's praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy. And Peter speaks of the new birth because Peter knew very well he had had a change in his life. He had been transformed. Peter was a rough uh, fisherman. And uh, he, he was a, 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 an individual who had a lot of rough corners. And uh, yet he found comfort and encouragement. He was a new person in Christ. He had a living hope. And Peter said we, uh, he's, uh, Jesus was raised from the dead and he's given us an inheritance. Now, I don't know about you, only twice in my life have I received something from an estate modest, but it was a great encouragement to be remembered. Now, you and I are in Jesus' estate plan, as it were, uh, and, and he talks about an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Now, no matter what kind of investment you make in this day and age, uh, it's likely to be at risk. But here's an investment, here is an inheritance that, that never per perishes, doesn't spoil, doesn't fade. It always uh, is there secure. And uh, now that's, that's our eternity. But you say, well, wh what about here and now? Well, Peter's got good news for us there too because he goes on to point out this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. So yeah, your inheritance is secure. You don't need to worry about it. Uh, it's in God's safety deposit box. And no one yet, uh, aside from God himself, knows the, the uh, uh, code to open that box. So it's, it's uh, kept in heaven, but who through faith are shielded by God's power. So uh, not only is our eternity uh, home secure, 
But here and now, God is shielding, God is protecting, God is guiding, and we're shielded by God's power. Is God's power enough for the challenges we face in life? Do you think God's power is sufficient for the COVID virus? Well, I, I don't think God is taken by surprise by anything that happens. We're part of his eternal plan. So we're, we're shielded, we're kept by the power of God and kept until the coming of salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, Peter's writing uh, about 2,000 years ago almost, and uh, uh, they, they were anticipating the, the return of Christ and all through these 2,000 years, believers have lived in anticipation. We can safely say we are nearer to the second coming of Christ today than ever in history. And if you look at things that are happening in the world today, I have to feel that we are uh, uh, in the 11th hour. Uh, whether we're in uh, 1101 or 1155, uh, we're in the 11th hour, as it were. And uh, the, the faith you and I have in the Lord Jesus Christ is the best investment we have ever made. He says, in, in this you greatly rejoice. So we're, we're thankful, we're rejoicing in our eternal home, but maybe right here and now, it's not uh, easy to rejoice. And Peter points out, now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And uh, uh, one translator has put this, uh, variegated colors. Uh, uh, trials come in all the colors of the rainbow. Uh, uh, when, when you think you figure out what could happen that's bad, uh, like the fellow said, they told me, cheer up, things could be worse. He said, so I cheered up, and sure enough, they got worse. You know, and uh, uh, if it wasn't for trouble, uh, you and I sometimes wouldn't have any, anything at all. But he's talking here about troubles come in all kinds of sizes and, and things. But he said, they, these have come not mindlessly, but graciously allowed by God the Father. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith. Now, a goal that you and I recognize is of great value. Uh, gold doesn't just come from the ground, nice and pure, and you make uh, uh, jewelry out of it immediately. It has to be refined and processed. And he's talking here about uh, greater worth than gold, which perishes. <laughs> now, uh, uh, even gold is not uh, the, the uh, most secure. But your salvation and mine is secure in, in heaven by the grace and power of God. And all of this God has intended should result in his praise and glory, but at the same time for our great benefit. And so uh, faith that like, like this ought to bring a sense of joy in a time of life when there's not much reason in our environment for joy. He says, though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. I don't know how you feel this morning. Uh, would you just say, well, I'm filled with an, uh, an inexpressible and glorious joy. You might say, well, listen, I'm, I'm here, and uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, uh, taking nourishment, I, I'm sitting up, I'm able to enjoy much of life, but he, he points out you and I as believers in Christ, even in the most difficult times, can find incredible joy. And we find it not in ourselves, we find it in the Lord Jesus Christ and his provision for us. And so he goes on to point out that salvation uh, that we enjoy today is not an accident. Uh, it was planned by God in ages past. Uh, it, it's a, a salvation that the prophets, now, have you ever wondered about the prophets of the Old Testament? Uh, they were an amazing group of people. Uh, the, the prophets apparently preached sometimes, and often in the Old Testament, they pointed forward to a day when, when God would send a Messiah, a Savior. And uh, they, they preached the message, but can you imagine a preacher today going home from Bethel and saying, you know, I've got to go home and study what I preached this morning. Listen, if you didn't study it before you preached it, uh, isn't it a bit late to be going home to study it? But he points out here that 
prophet searched diligently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances. Now, they knew there was a day coming when the Messiah would come, and they were just intrigued by who will he be? How will he know when we know when he's here? And so you've got this point out there, uh, the, the prophets studied what they prophesied. And if you ever wonder, I, w I don't know for sure if angels get a day off, but I, I would think maybe they have at least a day a week off, you know. But if, if angels have any day off, what do you think they do in their day off? Well, they don't play golf probably. Uh, I don't know that they do other things like that. Because even angels long to look into these things. Now, angels are fascinated with the salvation that God has provided for you and for me. Now, angels don't participate and receive that salvation, but you, they, they admire and they love to study all that God is doing and has done for you and for me. So. Uh, with, with that in mind, Peter says, this, with all of that that God has done, keep your eye on the finish line. Uh, uh, you and I recognize that we're, we're, sometimes we feel like we're in a marathon. There are occasions when we feel like it's a hundred yard dash, but whatever it is, you and I recognize we're, we're in a race, we're in the midst of life. And he says, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace that's to be brought to you when Jesus is revealed that is coming. You know, our home is in heaven. And here and now we've got a, 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 an opportunity to serve God, to make him known. Here and now we have the opportunity to experience God's grace and blessing in many ways. But this is not all that God has planned for us. And while we're focused on our eternal home, we need also to, to live here and now alertly, not mindlessly, not just stumbling through life, but he says, keep, keep your minds alert. Uh, and my dad used to have a sign on the wall that says, use your head, it's the little things that count. And I, I think he probably had a subtle suggestion in that. But the, the fact is, uh, you and I need to live alertly. And in all of this process, Peter reminds us, remember, the price Jesus paid for you. He said, live out your life and your time as strangers here in fear. You were bought with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. The salvation you and I have received is free to us, but it was incredibly costly because it was paid for by the life and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you and I need always to remember the value God has attached to our salvation and the price that was paid for it. And lest we forget that, Peter has emphasized it already, but he comes back and said, listen, uh, you were chosen before the creation of the world, uh, before there were any people on planet Earth, God had you in mind and he says, you were chosen before the creation of the world. Jesus was chosen, Jesus was planned. Your salvation was provided for. And it's revealed now in these last times for your sake. So you and I are the object of God's eternal love and plan. And God provided his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as our savior. And we now, Peter says, have a new forever life in Christ. Uh, we talk about uh, 70 years. Uh, now, these day and age, we sometimes think, oh, maybe I can push it to 80. Uh, I just recently turned 88, and I'm thinking, well, maybe 90 is a good number now. Uh, uh, but uh, every day is a new day. And uh, we have no guarantees in one sense, but he said, uh, we've obeyed the truth. We're to love one another deeply from the heart. You've been born again. Uh, the, the birth we have is an eternal new life in Christ. This life is temporary. Our eternal life is forever. And so we have to live now a new kind of life, Peter says. Uh, there are some things that are excess baggage. When you travel, you recognize this, and I, I want to take everything I need, but I've got to carry it, and I, I want to make sure I don't carry anything that I don't really need. So he says, rid yourself of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Now, 
Peter says, listen, there are a lot of things you, you, you should get rid of. Go through your closet, as it were, and clean out and get rid of these things. Don't give them to goodwill or the Salvation Army. Uh, better to put them in the trash. But he said, get rid of these things. But he says, like newborn babies, crave pure spirit, uh, spiritual milk. Uh, the Word of God is designed to produce growth. And so you and I need to have an appetite for it, like a, a newborn child that, that just is, is hungry. And sometimes it, you who are mothers know uh, they're hungry all the time, it seems like. But uh, uh, that, that hunger uh, that brings growth. And so he reminds us that you and I have a wonderful new identity in Christ. He comes back to this term, we've been chosen, uh, to remind us that we are special to God. Uh, and he talks about us being living stones, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Uh, and he goes on to emphasize this. He said, uh, uh, we're a, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Uh, but he said, just because we're, we're special to God and have all of these wonderful blessings, uh, don't mean that life, don't think that life is going to be easy. And he points out, we, we have a war going on within. Uh, and I think most of us would have to be honest enough to admit that uh, sometimes the, the, the person we struggle with is the one we live in and with. Uh, in other words, we, we, we sometimes have thoughts or ideas or appetites or interests that need to be suppressed. And he said, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. And uh, all of us have an old nature. When we become a believer in Christ, something incredible happens. We become a new person in Christ. Peter has talked about the new birth. So you and I as Christians are new people, but it does not mean the old nature has been eradicated. Not until we get to heaven are we going to be free from the old nature. In the meantime, we are to bring it under control of the Holy Spirit were to recognize its, uh, its attempts and threats and deal with them. Uh, the, the flesh is Satan's fifth column. I don't know if you remember the uh, Spanish uh, Civil War when uh, Franco was, was uh, taking over from the royalty in Spain. And he was asked one time, which of your four columns, because he had surrounded Madrid with four separate columns. And they asked him, which of your four columns is going to take Madrid? He says, my fifth column. Because inside the city, he had people who were loyal to his cause, who on a given signal would raise a rebellion within the capital. And uh, uh, Satan uh, uses the, the flesh in your life and mine as a fifth column. And uh, uh, he loves to, to uh, play on our appetites and our interests. Well, we, we want to move away from that. And so the, uh, Peter goes on to remind us that we, we can live free of Satan's control and influence. We're to live as free people, but not using our freedom as a cover-up for evil. Notice, I have freedom in Christ, but not freedom to just do anything and everything. I ought to live responsibly and wisely. And so we're to live, to show proper respect to everyone. We live in a fellowship of believers. And so we need to recognize that and relate to them positively in every way. It reminds us to follow the example set by Christ. When you think of Jesus was God, he was the creator or co-creator of all of the universe. And uh, uh, when, when he was tempted by Satan, he could have called legions of angels. All of the angels were just waiting for a signal and said, uh, uh, we're, we're happy to step in on your behalf. But Jesus did not uh, utilize all of the, the power that was available to him. He went to the cross willingly because he wanted to die for us. And so uh, Peter reminds us, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. If Jesus suffered for us, we ought to be able to suffer for him. And he just reminds, he committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he didn't uh, hurl the insults back. 
I don't know about you, but my inclination is, uh, uh, I've said it before, you know, you get attacked like that, you want to play Christian bingo. That's five under the eye, bingo. You know, well, uh, this is not, life is not a hockey game. <laughs> so uh, you and I have to uh, be uh, self-controlled, controlled by the Holy Spirit. And Peter now is going to point out some things. And, and ladies, he has something to say to you, but uh, those of us who are married men, uh, he doesn't leave us uh, out of the target either. Uh, he goes on to point for godly wives. He says, your beauty should not come from outward adornment. Uh, nothing wrong with dressing up and looking our best. But he points out that, that really the goal is uh, that of a, an inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. So our value is more than just our physical appearance. Our value is in the inner character and the godliness that, uh, that is evident in one's personality. And husbands, he says, listen, uh, you've got a high standard too. He said, in the way, same way, be considered as you live with your wives. It's not all about you. Uh, you're there as a caregiver, not a controller. He said, respect them as the weaker partner, as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. And an interesting thing he adds, which merits special attention, he said, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. As if you and I don't have the kind of home life we ought to have, uh, uh, when we come to pray, God says, listen, uh, no, uh, you know, I, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I hear your wife's problems. That's all I hear. Uh, and so he's uh, talking to husbands and saying, listen, your home life affects your prayer life. And if you expect God to answer your prayers, uh, Take care about how you govern your life at home. Uh, so God is watching our life at home, men, uh, when he listens to our prayers. And I don't know about you, but that's a little bit intimidating because I, I say, you know, Lord, do you mind if I just turn it on when I'm praying and, and uh, turn off the, the video camera or the uh, recorder the rest of the time? He says, no, I'm watching and listening all the time. Well. Uh, you and I, as believers in Christ, whether men or women, we're called to be different. And he says, live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love one another. Um, and that's not always easy to do because uh, every one of us has some uh, uh, differences or quirks or things we like and things that we don't like. But he says, we are called to live in harmony. And the fact is, when you and I uh, receive Christ as Savior, Following Christ changes everything. He said, whoever would love life and see good days uh, must do certain things. And so he gives us the positive. Keep your tongue from evil, your lips from deceitful speak. Turn from evil, do good. Uh, lots of things you and I can do to show forth the, the grace and goodness of God in Christ to others. But sometimes it takes more than just what we do. And so Peter goes on to point out, be ready to speak up for Christ. Uh, you and I have the opportunity to live for Christ in such a way that people see a difference. I became a Christian in, when I was just out of high school. In fact, the, the weekend I graduated, uh, that next Monday, I came to faith in Christ. It was the uh, third year I had worked for the government of Saskatchewan in what uh, they called a Department of Conservation and Development. Don't kid yourself, it was a hay gang. And uh, 12 to 15 hours a day, we baled hay in the uh, uh, valleys and the prairies of southern Saskatchewan. Now, uh, when it was a little bit wet in the morning, we were in the field waiting to go, what do you do? Well, you wrestle, you know, and, and you live in a bunkhouse uh, with all of these other men. And I found as a believer in Christ, my life was changing. And occasionally I had people ask me, why aren't you like you were last year? Well, it gave me an opportunity to share the fact that I had come to faith in Christ, and uh, that made a difference. Uh, and one of the men I worked with, he, he began to talk about, well, he said, you know, when I was younger, they used to call me preacher. And uh, because he was a Christian, but uh, he in later life hadn't been living for Christ as he felt he ought to. 
And the fact is, you and I are new people in Christ. We need to be ready to speak up for Christ and not be afraid of dissent or difference because we're here to make a difference. And so he calls out for us to follow the pattern set by Christ. Uh, was Jesus loved and followed by everyone? No. Uh, even though he was a, a lovely person, a person who ought to have been loved, he said it's better if God's will, if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Listen, if you and I are going to be called on the carpet, let it be for something good we've done rather than for some evil we've committed. And so he's just urging believers in Christ to live for Christ, whatever the consequences might be. And uh, if you're living for Christ, it's very possible, certainly it was in Peter's day in the New Testament times, that suffering came simply because you were a believer in Christ who lived differently than the world around you. He says, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourself with the same attitude. Now, uh, look at Christ and how Christ handled suffering and take your cue from that. Uh, I said, uh, uh, if you suffer as a believer in Christ, it's in the will of God. And uh, he said, uh, don't, don't try to avoid it. Don't be embarrassed by it. He said, the day of reckoning is coming. <laughs> uh, they're going to have to give account to God. Uh, and, and you don't want to uh, uh, ma make any mistake that will cause them to say, well, I've seen Christians and I don't want to be one of them. Uh, well, you want to be sure that they, they would have to stand before God and say, listen, I saw believers in Christ. I ridiculed them. I wish I hadn't. And they're going to have to give account to God. He said, they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So he said, listen, uh, be sure that your testimony for Christ always commends Christ and calls attention to him. And he adds that time is short. Uh, the end of all things is near. Now, here you and I are 2,000 years later, you might say, well, listen, uh, uh, a lot of history has taken place since Peter wrote 1 Peter. But the, the reality is you and I stand much, much closer. Now, I think it's fair to say that if you look at the time frame of all that God has done in creation, you and I are definitely in the 11th hour. In other words, uh, we're, we're much, much closer to the end times. Christ could return, judgment could come at any time. And so it behooves us to live wisely and well for God, to recognize that every day matters. So Peter says, above all, love each other deeply. Uh, love covers a multitude of sins. I don't know about you, but I need a lot of love. Uh, and, and all of us, I think, need to recognize we ought to love one another and recognize that uh, instead of picking fault with people, try to love them as Christ did. And Peter adds, don't be surprised by suffering. Now, no one of us really likes to suffer, uh, unless you're a masochist who just delights in uh, self-afflicted suffering. All of us prefer the good life and the life free from pain and suffering. But he says, dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering as though something strange was happening. Now, suffering for a believer in Christ is not uh, strange or unusual or odd. It's part of living in a fallen world and having allegiance to the, the God of love and grace who manifested himself in Christ. He said, if you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. In other words, if you and I suffer as a Christian, there's no need to be ashamed of it. In fact, he's going to go on and point that very thing out. He says, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed, uh, but praise God that you bear that name. Uh, if you and I suffer, it ought to be, it must be because of our allegiance with Christ. And uh, whether we're singled out by society uh, and caused to suffer, or whether it's Satan who brings trials and troubles into life to, to uh, afflict us, uh, whatever the source of the troubles, you and I should stand out and, and evidence we are a believer in Christ. He said, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. Praise God that you bear that name. Now, it doesn't mean you say, oh, I love to suffer. 
It just means that you recognize the cause of the suffering is because you were a follower of Christ, and therefore you can give thanks to God uh, that you're suffering, not because you enjoy the suffering, but because of the reason you're suffering. And he says, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and keep on doing good. And that was when you and I suffer, it's not time to quit. It's time to persist, to keep on. Uh, Jesus didn't quit before the cross. He went to the cross for you and for me. And years ago, I saw a sign that was uh, memorable that uh, uh, of Christ uh, going to the cross and Christ saying, I didn't quit. Don't you quit. And you and I are urged by Peter not to quit because Jesus didn't quit. He went to the cross for us. And so Peter goes on to, to write to leaders in the church in his day and age. Uh, the church then had elders, had uh, those men who were uh, single out to give leadership, to be shepherds of the flock. And he says, be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care, watching over them. Now, uh, a shepherd uh, cares for the sheep. A shepherd would risk his life to uh, care for the sheep. Uh, a shepherd acts out of love, not out of the, just the, the monetary value of the sheep. And so a shepherd in the hills of Palestine would uh, make sure that predators were kept away from the sheep, that the sheep were protected. And he's urging those who are leading in the church as the body of Christ to, to function as shepherds of God's people, care for the sheep, watch out for them. He says, not because you must, but because you're willing as God wants you to be. And the good news is, is just, when the chief shepherd appears and Jesus is portrayed in the book of Peter as the cornerstone on which all of, of the believing fellowship is built, he's the great shepherd who cares for the sheep. He's the, the sheep. He's the chief shepherd who's coming back one day for the sheep. So uh, Peter draws all of these pictures of Christ and points out that the chief shepherd, Jesus, is coming again. And you and I need to keep serving him until that point. And he calls out to the elders particularly, says, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Listen, you may not get a lot of accolades for your work in leadership in the body of Christ, uh, this side of heaven. Rest assured that any ministry you render for Christ is not overlooked or forgotten and that the reward is in the presence of Christ, is that the crown of glory that will never fail to fade away. And he comes back as he closes out this first letter he's writing to remind us God cares. Uh, he really, really cares. God has you on his heart. He has me on his heart. And now, you live in a world, we live in a world where we may not often feel loved or cared for by the environment around us. But Peter reminded believers, especially in that day and age, who were being persecuted, especially in some senses by the Roman government that was a militaristic domineering force. He said, clothe yourself with humility toward one another. He said, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Uh, you and I are just by nature, we want to be proud of things we accomplish and things we know. But the fact is, he said, uh, God's opposed to the proud, to those who are self. Uh, and uh, someone has pointed out that the man who professed, you know, I'm a self-made man. And someone else said, well, that must be a great relief to God to think he's not responsible for you. Uh, you know, if, if you and I are not self-made people, we're made by the grace of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. So he points out that uh, uh, under God's mighty hand, he will lift you up when the time comes. You may be oppressed and you may feel down right now. The day is coming when God will lift you up. And so he says, cast all your anxiety on him. I love what one translator put here. Cast all your cares upon him because it makes a difference to him about you. Now, he cares for you. Uh, you and I are part of God's loving care day by day. 
what happens in your life and mine is, is not overlooked by God. Now, I, I was thinking of this, and it, it, it's mind-boggling to me, with billions of people on planet Earth, how God can be aware of and interested in the intimate detail in every life. And yet God is able to do that so that every one of us here, a different person with different challenges, different ups and downs of life, there's never a moment that escapes God's attention, never a moment when he cares less or he's looking the other way and not caring for us. And so he says, cast all your anxiety on him. Are you anxious about health? Are you anxious about your job? Are you anxious about family? He says, cast all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Your life matters to God. And so if you bring your cares to him, you can rest assured God will listen and be sympathetic. But uh, there's someone else we have to recognize is present in the world too. He says, be alert, there's a lion on the loose. And he's, be self-controlled and alert because your enemy, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Uh, you and I need to always, every day, say yes to God, say no to Satan. He's always there, always at work, always a very real threat. But the good news is you and I are not in this alone. Peter points out the God of all grace. Uh, now, if you look at God, God is the God of all grace. Uh, God uh, just exudes grace. And the God of all grace, who has called us, each of us, to his eternal glory. Now, God has a plan for us. He already has a place in heaven waiting. Now, we don't need to rush to get there. We can drive the speed limit going home today. But the fact is, uh, God has each one of us in mind with the object of his loving care. And he points out that he's called us to his eternal glory. God has not called us to something we need to do next week or will experience uh, tomorrow. God has called us to his eternal glory. God has a plan for your life and mine that goes beyond this life and stretches into eternity. And he said, he himself will restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Uh, now, here and now, as we wait for the fulfillment of God's ultimate and eternal plan for us, God is prepared to give us the wisdom we need for today. He is prepared to give us the strength we need uh, to do what we ought to do and need to do. Uh, he says he, he's giving us all of the grace we need to be strong, firm, and steadfast. And he ends with that wonderful benediction to him, to the God who has loved us so much that he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to provide salvation, to the God who has such great care and power that he's watching over us every day, to the God who has an eternal plan for us, he said, to him be power forever and ever, amen. And I don't know about you, but I am grateful that Peter wrote this letter to encourage saints in his day and age who were suffering. And the threats they faced were much greater than what you and I face in this day and age. But the good news is the God who was sufficient for them in the 60s AD is sufficient today in 2021 and he will be sufficient for each of us in the days that lie ahead. And to that, then, you and I can say, as Peter did here, amen. So be it. God, thank you for your salvation. Thank you for your eternal care. Thank you for being here for us and with us in this day and age, in all that we face. Well, next week, Peter is going to introduce us, or we're going to be introduced to Peter's second letter. And uh, Peter's second letter is a bit different because Peter is on the threshold of martyrdom. Uh, if you knew that you were likely to die in just hours or days, 
Who would you want to write to and what would you write about? Well, Peter is in prison in Rome. He knows that every time he hears the boots of a Roman soldier coming to the door of the cell, it could be to take him to execution. So he's living with the awareness of impending martyrdom, but he's not down, he's not discouraged, he's triumphant in Christ. And so you and I next week will read what Peter has to say about guarding the truth, growing in Christ, whatever the threats might be. Well, that's next week. Until then, remember, God cares for you, God cares for me. His care is sufficient and sure. Father, we're so thankful that we live in a day and age when uh, we have much to uh, bring safety and security, uh, much to keep from us the threats of life and well-being, and yet all of us live with the awareness that we're living on borrowed time. Father, I pray that with Peter today, we would rest in your care and rejoice because we know that you're the, we're the objects of your love. Father, we pray that in the days ahead, we would show forth that love as we ask in Jesus' name, amen.